program. So. I love hearing that it's, because it was always my theory. Our son lived at home for a long time, and it was like it was important that he did because he was wouldn't have done well on his own. But when he finally left, we helped him chop, we helped him haul stuff, and I gave him money for the down payment. You know, just yes, fine. Well, it was really nice to have Carl with us in COVID because he was very helpful, you know. Mm -hmm. She starts um, September, the yeah, September meeting. Yeah. That's yeah. very impressive. <laughs> all right. Still, that's impressive. It's not okay. Bad. It's 5.30? Yep. Okay, it's 5.30. I'm going to call the meeting to order. Did all join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Indivisible, this is much easier to do in person than over the phone. <laughs> Everybody wants to the meeting. Exactly. <laughs> okay, we are going to open up the floor to communications from parents, staff, and district residents. Uh, I'm going to read our quick disclaimer here. Uh, the board appreciates hearing from parents, staff, and district residents. At our regular board meetings, the Board of Directors provides an opportunity for communications from parents, staff, and district residents. This time is reserved during our working meeting for the board to list the comments, input, and information. The board does not respond to comments provided as our goal is to listen and to learn. As appropriate, the board will ask the superintendent and her staff to look into any issues raised. Please note, it is important for all community members to feel welcome and safe during the board's business meeting. During the public comment period, please refrain from any positive or negative expressions, such as clapping or booing, in response to a person who is providing public comments. If any audience member has concerns about how they are being treated by any other attendee, please contact a cabinet member to report the issue. The board does not take public comments on issues related to personnel or individually named staff members at board meetings. However, you can email the board with any such comments. Okay, uh, we have our first speaker is uh, Tiller Thompson. Tyler, Tyler, oh, sorry, thank you. Tyler? Uh, on the comments, I said community concern is more policy concern, and I apologize for misinterpreting that. Mm -hmm. I also want to say quickly, uh, there's a policy in here, and if you let, if you, I have permission to go through my whole thing, I promise it's going to come up, but it's okay. not going to be very evident at first. So, hi, I'm Tyler. I come today as a lifelong member of the community. Uh, I, like many others, unfortunately, some can't be here, and concerned about the actions of one of our school board representatives. Again, the policy will come, I promise. Uh, recently, the school board member chose to post a picture of themselves and an individual currently under federal investigation for pedophilia and child sex trafficking on a public social media account. Additionally, the comment attached to the photo uh, kind of shows that this man is a model leader. What concerns me most is that when the community rightfully brought their concerns to this individual about this post, this individual chose to attack and belittle members of the community along with the political lines. Now, I know we all make mistakes, but uh, this individual chose to disregard and double down instead of taking constructive criticisms and valid concerns the community had, again, insulting those who brought those concerns forward. Now, you all need children, and I understand that it's a huge responsibility, but uh, we as a community uh, want to see our children protected. Uh, I question the actions made by, these individual, by this individual. And I would like to ask the board to either make a statement or present policy on what is and is not appropriate for board members when they associate with people under investigation for crimes against children. I also ask that uh, if the board so chooses that this person be uh, investigated or if they're, uh, uh, what's the word? Is keep, for if this person is capable of being a school board member due to his or her absolute hostility towards members of the community who brought such actions to light. Thank you and have a great week. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rachel Osler. Hello, thank you for your time. Like many communities and school boards, we don't agree on everything. We all want what's best for our students. Where we differ is how we think we should go about achieving that. Critical race theory is not a synonym for culturally relevant teaching. 
Culturally relevant teaching is deeply embedded in students' home lives, communities, and cultural funds of knowledge, their life experiences, which for some of our students involve systemic racism. Using books that depict that beautiful diversity we have in our community, books that act as mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors for all, all of our students is not CRT. It's best teaching practices. Educating students on historical events like the Tulsa Race Massacre, the Bracero Program, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Indian Removal Act is not CRT. It's best teaching practices. Maya Angelou, an esteemed Black poet who has, whose work has been banned and contributions to society were unjustly hidden from students by school boards under the false pretense of banning CRT. Once said, you know, when you know better, you do better. Now that you've been given factual information about CRT in our district, I hope that this board does just that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's it for our in-person. Do we have anyone online who would like to give comment this evening? Nothing is saying no. No? Mm -hmm. Okay. No. We are going to move on. Thank you very much. Okay, next on our agenda is consent items. I move to approve the consent items as written. Okay, I have a first. Do I have a second? I second. Race. Perfect. Okay. Uh, Patty, I'll call for the roll call vote, please. Okay, Mr. Galbraith? Yes. Mr. Valentine? Yes. Ms. Thunbit? Yes. Mr. Mabry? Yes. And Mr. Connors? Yes. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, next, we have superintendent and board member reports. Dr. Pierce. Okay, well, it's nice to see everyone. We had the meeting in July where board members attended remotely, so it feels like it's been a while that we've all been back together. Uh, here on the district side, we're really excited for the start of the 22-23 school year, and we have been busily preparing over these past couple months and throughout August. We held our administrator meetings as we do every year. And we do have a number of new administrators this year and administrators in new positions. And at the September meeting, uh, we'll be introducing formally the new people to you so uh, you can see the names and faces and start to put that all together. Um, we also have a new student board representative and uh, the new student board rep always joins us at the first meeting in September each year so that's when London will be officially here mm -hmm. and we're glad to have her she's reached out a couple times so she and I've been in communication and she's been in communication uh, with with Zach so uh, he's been uh, helping prepare her and we're really excited to have her join us uh, this Friday next Monday and next Tuesday are our staff professional development days and so our teachers will all be back in buildings for training and preparation and we also have the annual all staff all staff welcome back assembly Tuesday morning first thing Tuesday morning and board members are all invited to attend if you'd like to attend uh, so it's been a busy summer as we've been gearing up for school to start uh, we've been hiring staff and making preparations I wanted to note one thing that was new this year was kindergarten kickoff and I don't know if you've seen it was in in the paper it's on our website on our uh, social media but it provided the opportunity for many of our incoming kindergartners to come into school already to meet their fellow students meet their teachers families to meet teachers and it's uh, really given them the opportunity to ease that transition as they start school for the first time. Uh, they will be, by the way, the class of 2035, in case you're <laughs> keeping track. <laughs> um, I also just want to give a big shout out to my team here, uh, everybody who works here in this building, uh, to transportation, nutrition services, facilities and maintenance, and to all of our schools for all they're doing and have been doing to get ready for our big first day coming up. The first day is Wednesday. Next Wednesday, August 31st, we do have uh, some of our high schools doing a freshman only day. We've got a slow start for kindergarten, which allows some parent teacher conferences before all the students come back. So all of the details about the first day are um, on our district website. Families are probably also getting those communications directly from schools, but we have a school guide 
uh, back to school guide on our district website. It has all the details and lots of useful information for families. And we're just really excited for the school year to start. Wanted to share one other kind of big thing, and it's a big check. <laughs> oh, Always fun to share a big check. Uh, we, uh, our schools participate in our district in the GISA Affinity Card Partnership. And uh, this year, just a couple weeks ago at the annual <laughs> celebration, we were awarded this big check and a real check to go with it uh, for $59,233. And this nice. money all goes to our ASBs in our schools. So wow. this goes right to our students, helps to support DECA and uh, pay for um, other student related uh, things, ASB things. So we're really grateful for Is that Lisa. the first time we got, did we get that like every year? We get it every year. Really? Yeah. Great. All right. I feel so. like it comes right out of my checking account. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we're really grateful for all the people, right, who have um, the the, card. the branded cards and 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 for Gisa for having this program. So wanted to share a big fun check. Mm -hmm. Very cool. <clears throat> yeah. Wonderful. Big fun check. Uh, Gabe, you have anything to report today? Um, yeah. So. I it's a couple of weeks back, I attended the active shooter training with KPD at Kamaikin. Um, I did both sessions, so a little over three hours um, watching scenarios and stuff play out. And um, the, the takeaway for me from that is our, our KPD staff and those um, around in the area are um, definitely um, prepared and committed to ensuring the safety of our students. And so it was good to see that and talk to the chief and um, just kind of pick his brain a little bit on um, school safety. And then um, just want to, I just want to highlight uh, one particular uh, teacher and I'm sure she does this for all her students, but um, I, I got a letter from Miss Heights at Ridgeview who uh, my son was in last year. It was this great letter, told her how excited she was for him to be in sixth grade. And I know she does that for all her students, but I just see that, I mean, the impact there for those kids is gonna be a lot. And I know a lot of teachers do that. I just, this was personal to me. So I uh, just wanted to call that out. So that's it. Okay. Yeah, so um, I was able to meet with, is this thing on? Can you guys hear me? So I was able to meet with um, uh, the new um, athletic director of Southridge, Rick Wells. And uh, really, I really left impressed. I was only with him for probably 45 minutes, but um, I left very impressed about his vision and his and all the different things he's he's thought through. And I just really uh, wanted to say that. So that was a great hire. I think think he's going to do fantastic there. And he's got a really, really just a, really, a lot of really cool, neat, fresh ideas. And um, I really thought, thought that was a great meeting. I met with a few teachers, a couple different meetings with teachers this week. And again, I left impressed that they were just awesome, awesome teachers. And um, I just, I mean, I just, I just really, I was really glad that those were the teachers that are teaching our kids. And I, I really like that. And then, <clears throat> last thing is, working on something uh, with Bruce, the maintenance uh, guy, um, and we're working on trying to try to create a soccer field for. I don't know if you, do you know, let me know this yet. Does he tell you? <clears throat> working on trying to trying to have a. a you talking a, about Eric Bruce? Eric Bruce. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, working um, having a soccer field uh, like a public partner, uh, a public relationship with uh, Three River Soccer to add a soccer field for them and. And I, I, that's, the, that's the thing I think that's great about schools is if we can kind of continue to grow that community bond, I think it's really great. So anyway, those are the couple things that I did this last couple of weeks and great experiences. Tyler, can I ask a question about, is it a soccer field? Yeah. Associated with the schools? So no, so we have an unused piece of grass and it's just right, actually right over there. And, and then a, a local soccer club wanted to use, see if they could use that uh, for a field. Um, uh, play some of their games there. So we're kind of going through that process of seeing if we can kind of create a scenario where uh, we can have a field that, that they can play on. And that'll go through the... Yes. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. It's, yep. yep, it's going through that process right now. Thank you. Diane? So Dr. Pierce will laugh when um, Gabe talked about <clears throat> the active shooter thing. So I happened to have my scanner on because I was listening to an accident that a friend of mine was in. And I heard that there were a sh there was a shooting. This was on Friday at Kamaikan. Well, I knew Thursday they had done the active shooter. I didn't know they were doing it Friday. So I call Patty really quick, and she says, well, Dr. Pierce is in a meeting, but I'll send her a thing. So I did attend via scanner. <laughs> and I have to tell you, listening to it also was super, super impressive. 
and all of the different uh, agencies in the area and how how well everybody coordinated it. So once I realized it wasn't for real, <laughs> and Dr. Graves got in touch with me, she said, no, it's just practice. Um, they they really do, and I've seen them do it at Southridge before. And so just to know that how well we work with KPD and KFD and everybody else, that it, it doesn't make you feel perfect, but it makes you feel a little bit more um, confident in, in safety issues. Um, also, um, attended the Benton Franklin Mobility Task Force meeting a week or so ago. For those who had um, youth who were on the free fair for the summer, which was uh, kids through 18, was supposed to be up at the end of August, that free youth fair is now permanent. So if you have a youth that rides Benton Franklin Transit, um, you just need to get a card, which you can get through Benton Franklin Transit, any of the transit centers or online. So that's um, something they've been working very hard for. Um, I attended not the one last night, but a couple weeks ago, the Richland School Board meeting online. Um, also, the Racial Equity and Social Justice Tri-City Coalition monthly meeting, our um, League of Urban Latin American Citizens monthly meeting, and then WASDA networking hour which um, the important thing that came out of that was updated uh, Department of Health COVID guidelines, which Dr. Pearson, all the principals are um, up to uh, date on that. And if you have questions, you can talk with Dr. Pierce or Brian Love about mm -hmm. those things. So August was kind of a calm month. I'm sure it'll come along. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Mr. Avery? Yeah, I have a couple of things. I uh, went to the National School Board Association meeting in San Antonio, Texas. And it was stress, uh, as we all know, to keep your finger on the pulse of the national school uh, policies and uh, procedures that have been proposed. And one was uh, funding, full funding of lunches. And we were given a heads up that that could go away. And sure enough, it's is going away. Full funding of, of, of school lunches is going away. And then uh, I was also invited by a library staff from Washington Elementary to come uh, visit. And I think that invitation is open to everyone. So they really want yes. to show what that library staff is capable of. So I thought I would pass that on. Can I make a comment about lunches? Washington State is not a part of the money going away for lunches. So we are covered. That's part of the USDA program. The part that's going away. Yeah. 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 Perfect. Okay. But it, it, I'm going to follow up on that. It wasn't so much it's gone away as that that happened behind the back yeah. of most citizens. Most citizens don't know that, that we didn't get it. But there are some people that are blindsided sending their kids to, I'm, I'm talking about across the country yeah, now, sure. thinking that they possibly would have free lunches and, yeah, and they don't. They would be blindsided by such a thing. Uh, I really don't have much. I actually also went to the active shooter uh, program there for about an hour. Uh, it was impressive to watch the people work, watch them go through the scenarios there, and I was, they, they were very good. Nice, nice to see them. Um, other than that, pretty quiet. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Uh, next on our agenda is reports and discussions. We're going to talk about strategic objectives. Um, so board members, one thing I'm going to ask here in order to, to try and keep us moving here, let's keep our, our questions till the end, please. Uh, that way that we can let uh, Dr. Pierce and the other presenters go through their program and then we can ask questions at the end. Thank you. All right. So uh, we each year, as you know, we have a strategic plan <laughs> and uh, as a district and uh, that strategic plan has a mission and a vision and strategic goals that remain the same every year. And uh, that mission, vision and goals are right here on our screen. Uh, this is just that poster version of our plan. We've got the full plan that contains all of the performance indicators and targets that are tied to each goal. And each year we 
specify annual objectives or uh, essentially the work that we're going to do that year uh, to continue to try to meet our targets and our overall goals. And we track all that progress and report it to the board. You'll see an update of that progress in September um, it, on our district performance indicators and targets annual report. So tonight I'm here to uh, share with you our annual objectives, which have been updated for the 22-23 school year. I want to touch on the process for how we update those objectives. Uh, we begin by uh, looking at our data. We look at our student staff and family survey results. We look at our student academic achievement data and other organizational data and information that we have. Uh, we look at new requirements that are coming down from the state. Uh, we assess areas that need improvement um, or you know, continued attention. We get additional input from administrators and staff, and we get input and uh, priorities from you, the board. And uh, that was discussed, if you remember, at the annual retreat in June. And then uh, my staff and I, we take all that information and we synthesize it and we develop our uh, new strategic objectives for the year. So uh, I want to touch really quickly and just to remind the board about the board priorities. So this was work that the board did in June, and I know it seems like a long time ago because it was, so I just wanted to refresh your memory real quick. Um, at that retreat, the board reviewed results of your annual 2022 self-assessment. And one thing you did was identify areas of strength and opportunities for growth for board work aligned to the WASDA standards for board governance. Those five standards are shown here on the screen. And from that discussion, the board identified these uh, areas for focus. If you remember, I was up taking notes on white paper and took all that white paper back to my office and typed it all up and, and synthesized it. And from that, uh, what the board identified was uh, an interest in, in having increased community interaction and dissemination of information, uh, increased ways to include stakeholders, including parents and students in processes. Uh, board identified wanting to ensure that you as a board have uh, enough time after you receive some information to do research and, and um, so forth before making decisions. You want to continue to ensure that we've got as a district effective systems for instructional quality and staff evaluation and that we're maintaining our high standards for budget and resource management. So uh, if you remember back to January 2022 when the board new board first uh, was forming with our uh, new board members at the time, um, the board identified some priorities at that time. So this is from January of 2022. And the kind of big buckets or areas of focus at that time were student safety. Uh, that was, you know, back during COVID. So understanding, navigating COVID, funding, and then student learning and performance. So in June, um, you identified, you looked at that, and then you identified like, what, what now? What, our priorities now at this time. And uh, there was still a lot of focus obviously on um, student performance and, and success and especially post-secondary data and what our students are doing after graduation, a focus uh, on increasing communication, a focus on safety, which a number of board members mentioned tonight, a focus on providing uh, supports for students, both social emotional kinds of supports and uh, kind of career life coaching again, increased community involvement and ensuring that we have good processes in place for crisis management. So uh, what I did is take these notes from the board meeting and uh, put it together with <laughs> your previous priorities that you'd looked at in January for kind of an updated board priority. Um, so uh, I don't know if you remember this whole discussion, but uh, really those big areas of focus continue to be student safety and crisis management, uh, community involvement, funding and student learning and performance. So I say that because I think as you take a look at our strategic objectives for 22-23, you're going to see uh, a lot of these same areas obviously reflected in our strategic objectives. So uh, there's a lot of information here. The board received it in advance. I'm not going to obviously go through all of these, you know, line by line with you, but I want to highlight <clears throat> just a couple of things per goal. Uh, first, I want to highlight that we uh, this year uh, expanded a bit on um, the wording that we're uh, using on our strategic plan on our 
our objectives to make sure it's really descriptive enough for uh, the public and for families to know what it is we're talking about. And we also organize them a little bit more so it's not just a big list, but it's kind of in areas of topic. For example, student safety and security, student social emotional well being. So this is all the work that we're doing in 2023 to continue to try to meet our targets and goal. Uh, some of the work is continuing year to year. We obviously don't just start from scratch, <laughs> throw everything out and just start over new, but it's a continuous improvement process and cycle. So we continue to identify things that are working, things that are effective and, and continue to do those things and to uh, implement new things where we see areas of need. So for our first goal, students are safe, known and valued. I just want to highlight the uh, district safety that, that was mentioned a number of times. Uh, we do have a formal district safety team meeting regularly to assess, that's the first bullet here, assess our facility safety needs. We've already made some improvements, for example, at Southridge High School um, on in that campus security in terms of entrance and secure uh, entrance. And uh, board members have after, especially after the uh, KPD training, have uh, mentioned a couple board members, some uh, potential ideas for ways to increase safety at our elementary schools. So we're in the process of investigating some of that and that will likely be a discussion as we come back in September and talk about the levy. When it comes to our second goal of all students are engaged learners, you're going to hear tonight the one I want to just highlight from here. This page is under curriculum and instruction. Uh, you're going to see a new policy being put forward uh, tonight that uh, includes the formation of an instructional materials committee uh, to in, in, uh, expand uh, parent involvement and, and staff involvement uh, in reviewing learning materials and instructional resources uh, prior to them being recommended to the board. So more on that one in just a moment. For our third goal, all students are ready for their future. Uh, wanted to highlight dual language because I don't know if you've seen it, but it's interesting just today, the state superintendent, uh, Chris Reichdahl, and there's an article in the paper talking about statewide efforts to expand dual language. And that's something that we've been doing here in Kennewick for a number of years and are continuing to do. And uh, I also wanted to highlight that we're going to be beginning the implementation of the comprehensive school counseling plan that the board approved in spring. And one other quick one I wanted to highlight is we're fortunate this year when it comes to thinking about college and career readiness and helping students prepare for post-secondary. This year we're going to have outreach specialists from Columbia Basin College. It's funded through, uh, through Columbia Basin College, but they will be able to be regularly on site at our high schools to help students with financial aid applications and uh, some of that post-secondary preparation work. So those are um, our three student focused goals. We've got seven goals. Three are student focused because our students are our most important. Uh, and we have goals focused on family, staff, community and district because all of those uh, people and uh, processes help us meet our student goals. For the our family focused goal on this page, I wanted to highlight again that instructional materials committee and some more uh, opportunities for families to be involved in those processes. I also wanted to highlight a new system called Parent Square, which we're going to be implementing. It's a school communication tool and it's going to help us unify school communications and will potentially help us with some uh, streamlining of volunteer uh, processes, which I know is another thing uh, the board has expressed interest in. When it comes to staff, uh, we've got lots of work going on connected to our staff focused goal. Uh, the one that I wanted, I wanted to highlight a couple of things here. Uh, one is uh, our, the board had mentioned kind of evaluation systems and we have real good um, state uh, kind of mandated, but they're very good processes for um, teacher and principal professional growth and evaluation. And we have some opportunity to look at some of our other um, areas. So we're going to look this year at our uh, professional growth and evaluation system for our central office leaders. There's some good uh, WASA frameworks and ways that we can strengthen those processes. We're also this year as a district really striving to intentionally infuse positivity uh, into into our uh, schools and workplaces. So that's something that you can be looking for as well. When it comes to our community focused goal. Uh, this, uh, by the way, just real quick, this what you see on the screen is a little bit different from what you've got in your board packet. 
uh, but it's really just a formatting thing, so I didn't want to send you a whole new packet just for a formatting thing. But uh, we've got lots of community partnerships that we highlight here and we'll continue to work uh, to strengthen. And um, we have in front of you our community ed uh, catalog. So I wanted to highlight that because one of the things we do uh, in terms of community value and appreciation is to offer adult learning opportunities to our community members. You've got a catalog there. It's been expanded. It's a really great program, and that's something that we continue to build upon every year. And then finally, when it comes to our district focused goal, lots of uh, work going on. And the one I want to highlight, of course, is around fiscal responsibility. Funding is an area that the board uh, continued to identify as a priority. Uh, we'll be working with you this year uh, pretty quick here in September to talk about developing a positive path forward for our levy. Uh, you know, we didn't pass our levy twice last year. Uh, that's something we've got to uh, put a plan together to address. Um, this year we are using those federal ESSER dollars, uh, one time money and the fund balance money uh, to be able to balance the budget along with making about $5 million worth of cuts, as you know. And you know from that process, it is not a fun process to have to make uh, budget cuts because it's people. Uh, and jobs and programs for kids. And so this year, you know, we're already operating with unfilled positions here in the district and a number of unfilled positions and facilities and maintenance. Uh, and so it's difficult to keep the same high quality uh, level of service without the same number of people, but we're we're doing our best to do it. And um, we've got to get together, as you know, in September, we've got that study session set aside to really talk about our path forward with the levy. So lots of information there to digest. Our next step is to take our strategic objectives and formulate our superintendent and cabinet goals. And then those are submitted to the board for approval. Those will go on a uh, consent agenda probably in September. So we'll get them to you uh, far in advance, but you'll see they're all directly connected to accomplishing this work that's outlined in our strategic plan. We'll be updating the strategic plan so it's available on our website and out for people. And then you'll see those updated performance targets and you can see the progress, which I'm happy to say we're making great progress on lots of our targets and you'll see more about that in September. Perfect. Questions from the board? I just have one quick question. You, you mentioned the um, committee that we're going to talk more about tonight. Um, I noticed in here there's a mention of a community engagement board. Is that a yearly committee thing or is that something we're coming up with or what can you just kind of you bet. Explain that to me a little you bet. bit. So the community engagement board was new last year. So it's something that will be continuing this year and it's really connected to school attendance and to helping students re-engage with school if there's chronic absentee going on. Okay. So we did a call out. Uh, this is something that all districts now have. It's part of new state laws and those kinds of things. So we did a call out invitation last year to community members to help uh, participate on this community engagement board. We may have some more opportunity this year to um, put that message out and invite more people to attend. But essentially it's in instead of going to um, to court, um, and like truancy court, there's now a process where um, students and families come in and meet with members of the community who help um, figure out resources and um, strategies to help re-engage the student and get the student to school so they're engaged in learning. Thank you. You bet. Any other questions? Perfect. Chris, thank you very much. Okay, so we've got strategic objectives. Uh, next on our agenda is unfinished business. Uh, we've got policy 2340 instruction, race and the curriculum first reading. Okay, so still me for a little bit. Uh, um, again, uh, this is, I'm asking you to remember back to our <laughs> June retreat and then a subsequent board meeting. Um, at the June retreat, the board discussed uh, critical race theory, and uh, there were some notes that I'll just bring up real quick from that meeting where the board really went through a, a process of discussing in great detail and at length uh, about this whole concept of, of CRT, what it means, what it doesn't mean, and um, what we want to ensure students are taught 
in our schools and not taught. So these were notes that I took uh, from that board discussion. You guys first looked at these and a draft policy based on these notes um, back in the spring. <laughs> Don't remember exactly which board meeting, but um, this was the draft of the um, policy that you looked at once before. Um, this policy, I took the board's notes, uh, drafted it into policy language, and um, this particular policy is uh, pretty parallel to our policy, existing policy on religion in the curriculum, but it's, it's talking about race in the curriculum. So board looked at this and had some discussion and uh, there were some suggested edits by individual board meet members. So this next document that you see was some of those notes that I took where individual board members were saying, well, I would like to see that part struck and this part added, and I don't think we need that part. and We need to add this word and that kind of discussion. Then at one point, the, uh, the board had some questions potentially for legal counsel. And uh, so we got Bronson Brown here tonight and the board tabled this discussion until this meeting. So that just brings us up to speed on where we've been. And so now we're bringing it back to the board uh, to ensure that we can answer any questions that you have. The board can have further discussion about potential edits and potentially um, act on the policy. So as Dr. Pierce said, we did table this uh, at our, what was it, our June meeting? Yeah, June meeting. I think it was a June meeting, yeah. yeah. Um, so we got it and then as she stated, we had, we were looking to make a couple of changes. Uh, how does, you know, who has questions regarding this? Everyone happy with the way this is written? Anything that you'd like to see changed, edits? Yeah, I mean, I, <clears throat> I know that we're not going to agree on it, but I, I would like to see the no CRT to be top, but I know that we're not going to agree on that. So, but other than that, no, I, I'm good with it. <clears throat> Can I pass? I'm looking because I know I had a question before and it was related to Bronson going through it and checking for legalities, but I'm trying to find it specifically, Bronson. But if you know what it is, please come and remind me. And just while Bronson's coming up, the other thing that I recall is there was some question from the board, and I don't know if this was your question um, specifically, but about a resolution versus a policy. That was one of them. I okay. Think. One of them. So it's, uh, and I can address that. The reason why this is proposing a policy is because if the board wants to enforce it, for example, if there are staff members that aren't following this policy, then the district can enforce it. That's how they enforce the policies. The resolution is more of a statement of, of where the board stands on certain positions. And the policy is is essentially direction to the staff and the district as a whole. This is this is policy. This is how the district's going to be run. And then, um, so then we use those policies when we, if there's concerns with employees or what have you, or give them direction on 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 their work you go to the policy what does the policy say so perfect because i think that that was the one thing my recollection is that we did want to make this a policy we did not want a resolution we wanted to yes correct this in the district mm -hmm. yeah i think that's correct and, and i did review this i didn't have any concerns with the legality of it um but diane specifically if there's something in there that no because I wanted you to look at that because I wanted to make sure that it was clean. Yep, and I looked at it and I didn't, I didn't, I didn't see anything that would fly in the face of any of the existing laws. So, yeah. okay, thank you. Can I just make one clarifying comment or, or question? So, the highlighted second line the, at the bottom of the second paragraph, all of that was in the original draft, with the exception of the red lettering, right? That's correct. So the highlighting doesn't mean You're anything. Correct. In the, I okay. just highlighted the parts yeah. that were tweaked at all. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yes, this whole sentence was in the first version. The ad that was suggested was the or inferior language. Thank you. Any other questions? I, I did find my notes um, and 
Dr. Pierce, you can remind me, um, and maybe Bronson can back this up. We talk, I had asked about academic freedom of controversial topics, and we already have policies for that. So this would in no way undermine those policies. That that's correct, okay. and and essentially with the academic freedom policy, and I could bring it up if we want, but it 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 allows for academic freedom within the scope of the district adopted curriculum. Um, okay. So if it's not part of our curriculum, then I mean academic freedom doesn't you know it's right. not free license, no. but it's within the the right. scope, and so this policy and that policy don't conflict. Okay. That's what I needed to know. Thank you. If there's no other questions or comments, I will entertain a motion. Uh, Go ahead. <laughs> I motion that we approve policy 2340 race and the curriculum uh, as written in this draft okay. for, first. for first and second reading. Perfect. And I second that. Wonderful. Any other questions or comments? If not, I will call for the roll call vote, please. Mr. Galbraith? Yes. Mr. Valentine? Yes. Ms. Fenvit? Yes. Mr. Mabry? Yes. And Mr. Connors? Yes. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. May, may I ask a question you? before we go? So, the, well, I hate to bring this up because it, is, it seems like closure here, but I got to ask this question. This is race and the curriculum. Correct. How do we cover race in the day to day operation of the school? So uh, uh, the, the incident that we had last year where we had a student declare a national end day mm -hmm. and that student, sorry guys, but it seemed like they walked away pretty lightheadedly and then there was another student that said, I'm going to do it next year. I wasn't aware of that one. I'll show it to you. Okay. 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 But the sure. young man said he's going to do What are we doing to face that issue? Because this is great. We, we took care of it for the curriculum, but we have kids that go to school each and every day that are faced with the fact that they are not the majority at that school and that there are national end days where they are targeted. Yeah. We talked about that in September, maybe? Would that be like a... a... No, right now. No. Yeah. I, I think what? it's... Oh. Go ahead, sorry. <clears throat> I was just gonna say, I, I, that in my opinion will be covered under our, our bullying, our harassment, our discrimination policies that we have written. I would, I would think that's well, where I would... And that's a good point. And they beefed up because obviously it's not strong enough because a kid, two, three, four, five kids yeah. decided it. And I did not see, I have not seen where they have been, I don't want to say harshly punished, but it, it would, I'm, I'm sorry, Gabe, from my point of view, they're getting off light. Yeah, I don't disagree with you, Ron. So I, if, if that's something that we, we need to discuss and beef up, then right. let's, mm -hmm. let's okay. look at it and, and do it and, and figure out how we can do that and, and prevent it yeah. from happening yeah. when it's already declared that they're going to do it again this year. Yeah. Could we check to see if there's been any new information about whether that was addressed or have you checked on that and it was not addressed? I have not followed up on it. It was just what happened last, as it year, last, right. last time. So yeah. it, you may have and I, I don't want to discredit you or the staff. You, you probably know more than I do, and I have very, very good faith with the staff and yourself. It's just that it's my duty as a school board member to absolutely. bring Absolutely. And so uh, just a couple things from my perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in, in no way um, do we condone sure. racism, discrimination, uh, any of that. And we do have policy language that's very specific about it. What is unfortunate in our world is is we do have incidents that that happen, um, and and sometimes and I don't I wish we could prevent them. I wish we could prevent individual kids um, from coming to school and and doing things that are abhorrent. Um, we can address them though when they do happen, and we can do our best to proactively create cultures in our schools and in our systems where everybody belongs. And that's what our CCDEI, that's the work of cultural competency, diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's not CRT. <laughs> it's about creating cultures 
where every student belongs and where every student knows it's not okay to discriminate, to make fun of, to make anybody else feel like they're less than or other. And that's what we're all about. And, and we are working our social emotional learning standards that the board approved. That's a step in our direction of, of helping kids to understand the harm that it causes and the ignorance um, when those kinds of things happen. And so we need to teach kids, not only academics and so forth, but teach them how they need to treat one another. And that's what cell standards are all about and how they need to treat themselves and be aware of the fact that our world and our schools are diverse places and everybody deserves to be there and to be treated with dignity and respect. And so we're, we're continuing that work and we need to have good policies, which I believe we do, and good follow through um, on those incidents. I will follow up. I do have specific information. I'm going to share it publicly about, you know, student discipline, which we're not able to do, but just follow up on that particular um, incident to make sure that the board uh, knows what the what all occurred as as follow up and follow through and consequences. Um, and and we're, we work on that every year. It's ongoing and um, 100 percent. I just want to say that. Thank I just want to make a comment to Ron. So what I was saying before just a minute ago, it was I agree with you and I want to give that I think we need to give that like proper time. Yeah, so proper time. So like I think that'd be a good time to like <clears throat> to really discuss it or either on like the, you know, the, the retreat or something like that. But like this isn't quite doing it justice, right? I think we need to be like a full time where we can really dive into it because I agree. <clears throat> That's a good point. Thank you. Thanks, guys. All right, so uh, on the new business, we have policy 7430, financial management lease capitalization Ooh. capitalization threshold. Here comes the big man. <laughs> Deep pockets. <laughs> Deep pockets. He's going to sell fun. <clears throat> so, yeah, a little update here on uh, lease capitalization. So, uh, as it stands now, when, when we have uh, we have uh, like an IT server lease. Uh, we do have one right now, and it's about 2.5 million. Uh, we've entered into it a couple years ago. Uh, the new policy here uh, that that, that uh, GASB Governmental Accounting Standard Board would require us to book that whole 2.5 million as an expense in the year we sign up for that lease. And that's not our practice. Is to, to if it's a five-year lease, we do $500,000 a year, and that that's really more uh, applicable and, uh, to, to our books. And uh, so recently at uh, a business manager conference, they recommended to create a, a threshold. Uh, so a 1.5% threshold would mean you'd have to have a lease of 4.5 million, uh, $300 million budget. And uh, that threshold is high enough to where we would probably always be under that. And I could work with IT to, to make sure we fall under that and continue with what really is a more realistic booking of, of those costs. And that's what this policy does here. It's, uh, creates a threshold of 1.5% and uh, that, that should be adequate to, to continue with the way we've been booking those uh, those costs. And, and sorry, Vic, I'm sorry for asking. No, 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 no. 1.5% of what? Sorry for about the, the, the previous general fund, so 300 million generally is about 4.5 million. Thank you. So if I may ask, what what's the idea behind having us book? I mean, that they, they uh, like they want to create it more like a financing, so you put it as a liability and you kind of amortize it down. It, it really is not that relevant for governments. They, they right. do it for you know private organizations, uh, companies, but it, it doesn't really fit that well. There's a, a lot of rules like that that don't fit that well for cities and districts and governments. And, okay. Um, well, that, and again, the only, reason, the only reason you want to do that if you're trying to, you know, avoid a tax, right. you know, right. trying to pay taxes, exactly. you're going to do your bonus depreciation, whatever. Yeah. It just doesn't make any sense yeah. for a state in right. it. But right. anyway, I'm not an accountant, so that's why yeah. I had to ask. So we think the way we try to, to book those every year uh, is a lot more uh, realistic for the financial statements. Okay. Perfect. And you said that comes out to 4.5 million? Yeah, 1.5% uh, on a $300 million budget. It would have to reach minutes. that level. Yeah, you'd have to reach that. And that, you know, if, if Ron or someone came to me with a lease that was over that, we'd try to work it down so it would be under that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. 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 
any other Remember? thoughts or questions or comments? If not, I will entertain them. We, do you need a vote on this? Yes. Yes, we yeah, do. We need to. Yeah. Oh, this, okay. This is a policy. All right. I move to approve policy number 7430, financial management for first and second reading. Second. Questions or comments? If not, I will call for the roll call vote, please. Okay, Mr. Galbraith? Yes. Mr. Valentine? Yes. Ms. Sunvik? Yes. Mr. Mabry? Yes. And Mr. Connors? Yes. Thank you. Wonderful. All right, thanks. Thank you, sir. Uh, Second, we have policy number 3545, students interscholastic academic eligibility. First reading, Mr. Scott will be presenting. Okay, good evening. Um, policy 3545 um, needs to have some revision, so we're gonna be recommending some revision to that policy. Um, primarily around um, WIAA eligibility requirements. Um, districts are able to set their own eligibility requirements, but we do use the WIAA as a guide. And we know that the other high schools in the region also use those, so um, we try to align. Um, so most of the, the, the substantive change within this policy is really around academic probation. Um, but there, when we have some revisions, it's always nice to clean up some language in, the, in there as well. So you'll notice that there is some, some cleanup. Um, primarily, we looked at the title. Um, the title originally was extracurricular activities enrollment, academic eligibility. Um, we really feel the policy is about the ability of students to participate in, com in competition, interscholastic competition. Um, so we just wanted to rename that. Um, we also um, noticed that in terms of the, the number of classes a student needs to be passing, our eight period days at Highlands and at Park were, were not mentioned here. So we just added that piece in. Um, but the meat of the policy is really around academic um, probation and academic suspension. Um, one way to think about this is that we have two, basically two grading periods, one that, that ends um, at the, um, in January, first semester, and one that ends at the end of the year. And the rules change is really to address the ability of students to participate in athletics at the beginning of the school year based on their grades the previous academic year, so the previous semester. Um, we've had policy language for our incoming ninth graders to allow them to participate in a probationary status. This policy language revision would open that up to all students, um, grades nine through 12, um, to be able to have a probationary period um, as they enter into their fall sports season um, to allow them to participate um, in both practices and games. Um, they can always participate in practices while they're on academic suspension or probation, but this allows them participating in games and gives them a four week period of time um, to bring those grades up to to show that they're in good academic standing. Um, so that is basically the change to the policy that we are are proposing. Again, there is some other um, cleanup language involved um, around um, 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 kind of the uh, uh, or I guess just clean up around kind of formatting um, within that. Um, and I'm happy to answer any other questions, but that's really the meat of it. Um, the students would be academically suspended within the school year because they've been given an opportunity um, uh, by the end of their first semester. They then have an opportunity to um, bring those grades up, but they would be suspended from competition during that time. There's no change to that. That's been standing policy. So that's the changes to 3545. Yes, sir. I have a question. Uh, so I'm a senior and I want to play uh, spring sports, but I'm on probation. I can play spring sports. You can, if you have, if, if you have not met eligibility for that grading period that ends first semester, then the, you have a period of um, five weeks during which time you are suspended from competition. You're able to participate, um, but you have the chance to bring your grades up then. Um, so you, once you have your grades up and your eligibility is there, then you would be able to participate. Does that answer the question? Uh, so it's my thick brain that's not getting it all here, but if, what's the difference between participating and uh, what, what's the other term? The, Being the, part of or? Yeah, so there's suspension or probation. Yeah, it sounds like to me you, you're, you're on probation, but you can still participate, true or false? 
when you're on when you're on probation, you can still participate in games. So, for example, um, we're, we'll start football games here in about a week or so. Right. Um, students who were not eligible at the end of this spring semester are able to participate for a period of four weeks into the new school year, and that four weeks is designed to give them a chance to bring their grades up and show that they're in good academic standing. And if they're in good academic standing, then they then they're off probation and they're regularly eligible. Almost if, like it resets every year. Yeah, and if if at the end of that four week period of time they're not eligible, then they're in a period of suspension where they cannot participate in competition for a period of, of three weeks and then we'll do another grade check to see where they're at. Like it doesn't roll over from the previous year, right? Right, it right. It gives them a, it gives them an opportunity. They, they start on probation, so they don't just get a clean slate. They have a period of time. When, and so at that fourth Saturday, we'll be doing grade checks. And if the students are passing uh, in high school, five of six classes with the 2.0 GPA, then they're eligible to participate. What's the, what's the, sorry, Jay. Oh, no, go, go ahead. What's the football period? How many weeks of the season? Um, well, we started uh, we started practice last week, and it'll it'll go. And the end of it is typically in the end of October, November. Right. Doug? Yeah. Yeah. Ten weeks. Ten weeks. And where I'm going with this is, I'm a senior. You know, what's the incentive for me to get off of probation if I'm going to be allowed to play? <coughs> that five weeks you said five weeks right about well about four weeks it's probably going to be three to four games that they might be eligible to participate in okay. but so the incentive is if you want to finish out the season and make playoffs so you're going to be doing that appreciate it thanks Good. I, got, I got a few questions i actually read this a few times on um, the last couple of days so my, my first question I, I have a question that's related to ron's um so i'm a, I'm a student athlete i get a 1.8 gpa when I'm doing track my junior year. Then I, track is spring, spring sport. Spring sport. So mm -hmm. so now I'm ineligible for track in spring. So now I can go into the fall and I can go and play football for three weeks at least with no restrictions until another grade check happens to say whether or not I'm eligible or not to play. Right. Does that I, I think I see where the spirit of the the policy is going, but why i guess my question is are we rewarding a student for poor grades potentially in the spring and allowing them to just start fresh again like have we thought about maybe just having them allowed to play but not participate in games until their g like their grades are checked because i don't know it just seems like i don't know where where are we re like there's a reward to play right and you have to meet these criteria and if you don't like where, where's a little bit of a accountability on the grades, I sure. guess. Let, so let's go back to that example of that spring sport. So um, typically the, the grades, the, the grades that determine eligibility are at the end of the first semester. So I'm a student who's who's got a 1.8 GPA or I failed, you know, I'm failed one class. I have that five week period of time from the end of the semester to get to become eligible. Once I become eligible, then I'm eligible again until that next grading period, which ends the school year. So if I were not eligible after that five week period of time, I still have the 1.8, I wouldn't be able to participate in track competition right. for the remainder of for the remainder of the season. Right. So so but my understanding as we've discussed this with our athletic directors is that coaches have a, a a pretty fair amount of influence over students when they're in school to get their grades up to keep themselves academically eligible. The football coach doesn't necessarily have that ability in the spring to do that for players that he gets in the fall. So it's really designed to kind of help those kids and to, again, give them an opportunity to bring that up rather than waiting a five week period of time. And again, it, when we look at just that eligibility requirement through the WIA, the feeling was we didn't want to be at a disadvantage necessarily to other districts around us in mm -hmm. terms of holding our students to a, a higher standard than maybe what the other students are being held to. But more importantly, it was to give them an opportunity, to give them an, a, an incentive to get their grades up, to be able to participate and not lose almost half of their season. I see that point of view. I also, I also see, I kind of see both mm -hmm. points of view. In a sense, you're kind of like lowering the bar in a way, but I do see that makes sense to 
have balanced uh, all the other. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. As, as mm -hmm. with everything else, there are ways to work it, to work it in your advantage, just like being a redshirt freshman in college and you end up playing five years. So I, I see where you're going and I see where you're going. I have to say, I just think about me, myself when I was in, in school, if my grades were down, I would try to say, okay, I play three, four weeks hard, get the, maybe get some looks from the college coaches or what have you, and then I rest my knees. I don't have to, but I know, I know that athletes can't do that. If sure. you're competitive and you're good and you love football, you're going to want to play, play in the playoffs. I, I understand. I see where you come from. The other, the other thing to point out is that we do all, we also in Kennewick have a 2.0 GPA requirement, and that is not part of WIA requirements. Yeah. Sure. And it's not also in some, some districts. So we have a heightened level of, of academic achievement that's required to play. Um, and so that there is that piece as well. So it, you know, it certainly provides an opportunity for students to participate when maybe they haven't had that opportunity in the past, but th it's designed around that to give them the opportunity to be able to bring those grades up and, and play. I wanted to bring up one other thing. Okay, before you down, I'm sorry. I have one, one more question. We'll go yeah, ahead. Yeah, go oh, ahead. So, so, okay, so my, uh, my last question is the rule around class periods. So you have to have five, five class periods in high school essentially to be eligible for um, sports, right? So what does that do for the student who brought three credits up from middle school and doesn't have to take five credits their senior year? Like they only, maybe they only need three to graduate. So now they've got to just, we just got to dump another credit onto their, or a class onto their schedule to fill in the five class requirement when that student possibly maybe leaves school and goes and works a part-time job and gets a few hours in at work and then goes to practice versus throwing them in, you know, ceramics or art or just something to fill that spot. So, I, you know, my question is, is that a hard, fast rule or have we thought about the, the implications to some of those kids who, who do that? Because I think our running start kids are only there three, three class periods. I know they're doing CBC or whatever, right? So they're and in they school, usually come back. but yeah. right. So I, I believe and I, I, that those students, I mean, even though they're only three periods in, enrolled, I think the running start periods are also, I mean, it counts as being, as being enrolled. And to be honest, I would have to probably talk with our athletic directors a little bit more about like the frequency with which that impacts our senior athletes. Because um, I'm just not aware of necessarily that impact. Um, as we reviewed the policy, that didn't strike any. I mean, nobody said, "Hey, this is another thing we should think about because it's creating that 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 piece of it." The that the students can who are on track for graduation don't have to be enrolled in a, a total of six that classes. Does happen, they that have does to. Happen. So I would yeah. just have to probably do a little bit more looking into that and get you an answer. Yeah, and I I ask because and I ask because I know it's happening because mm -hmm. we just had to throw a fifth hour onto my daughter's schedule so she could be well, eligible because <laughs> she's only had four classes originally scheduled by the counselor. So it it, it might be infrequent, but sure. you know, I just don't want to add a right class just to add a class if, if we don't have to. So okay. So with the name change, uh, we didn't get away from the fact that uh, this is not just uh, football, basketball, start. You, we have band, we have the gaming clubs, and I think we also have DECA that's mm -hmm. also uh, governed by these, these rules. Is that right or wrong? Any extra curriculum? The competitions are governed by the, those rules. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I, I believe, I mean, so, you know, band competitions, those kind of things are governed by those same rules. Okay, so having said that, sorry about not, not comprehending this right away, but having said that, so if I'm in the band, but I'm not in competition, I'm just, you know, learning the, the uh, drums, this wouldn't apply to me as far as the GPA goes and me stand in the band? No, it wouldn't, it wouldn't apply. So you would have to, so you would have to be part of the marching band? Yes. For this stuff. To be under the WIA. Mm -hmm. w under WIA. Thank you so much. Okay. It, and and Diane point, pointed out. So it looks like there's a there's a paragraph in there in between some of these highlights that it it says it allows seniors 
to enroll in one less class than the minimum number. So right. that looks so like that would, need four. Right. would be. OK, yeah. thanks, Diane. So related to what we're talking about, students who work or whatever, with our new, um, I don't know what we're calling it, work study, where the kids are getting grades for working. I wonder, connected to what Gabe has asked, how that might um, connect with some of our students who are needing to or wanting to get credit for working. Is that going to be considered a class? So at this, credit? yeah. So at this point, we don't have those. Those rules haven't been created around providing credit. It's kind of on the horizon. Right. Um, so at what some point, when we have the rules that are generated for us to be um, doing that, we'll reevaluate how that might fit in. Uh, but at this point, we don't have where students aren't able to do that, so we don't have it. So my suggestion is, if a student gets a credit, mm -hmm. that should be counted as a class, right? Because you can't get credit for something you don't learn. I'm just right. I think I, mean, I think it's a yeah, it's a consideration once we get the rules to see how that fits really in. But inequitable yeah. that if I'm sitting in a class, I get credit and I'm OK. But if I'm out, uh, I don't know, working working HVAC, I'm learning some electrical, I'm learning all kinds of things that I should also be credited for that. So just if you keep that in mind, please. Yep. Comments or questions? I Ron's got to run. Can't This is very nitpicky, and I apologize. But we have a paragraph where it says schools may allow seniors on track to graduate or one last class. Right. And then we said uh, next to the last sentence, initially enrolled. Uh, can a kid pick up a class? Uh, let's say. Uh, two weeks within the semester say, you know, I don't want this art class. I'd rather do uh, journalism. Can they can they do that? Because they're still taking a class. Yeah, so if they if, were if they were going to be swapping a class, they could. So then that this is my concern. Then that's not the original enrolled class. You just seem like there's a gap there. Initially enrolled was the art class. Now if they come back um, in journalism and they make a poor grade, this gives them an out because this wasn't their originally a role class. The initially, role class was art. They now are in, in journalism, which they can have a poor grade. So generally, um, generally those ad drops are not going to happen beyond about the second to third week of school. Okay. And if a student said, oh man, I'm failing this class, so I'm going to drop this class to get into another class. Um, my sense is that that would not be something that we would allow the student to gain. That's actually in um, And yeah. if it, so That's if cool. they're, so again, if they were failing a class within that first two week period of time, um, I, I, I believe that we would be, we would be considering where were they at initially. And if they're just dropping a class to get into an easier class because they, that the, the, the sentence there that says they can't do that to gain eligibility would govern that. But semantically, that sentence says, like what Ron said, <coughs> the class in which they were initially enrolled. Mm -hmm. And that's the that's the thing there that if I sure. sign up for X, whether I'm failing it or not, if I change to something that I'm not initially enrolled in, does that then affect me? Because that, that's how that Reads. Can we say presently enrolled? Would that throw the whole thing off? No, they wish they are presently enrolled. Okay. In no, I'll change it. Presently no, I'll enrolled. change it. Yeah, because that, that, that colors accomplishes it. Wrong. Current. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'm what I'm wondering in regards to this clause is I'm wondering if it's again we're talking about seniors and we're talking about seniors who are enrolled in a minimum number of classes. Um, so I don't know how that may how that may change that. I mean, you know. So, um, but I can certainly. I, get, I don't think there's going to be a problem in changing that, but I would want I would want to do a little research just yeah. to make sure. Because sure. initially was the case. would be the first class in which they enrolled. Mm -hmm. Right. So that kind and of presently is, is any class. Right. right. Yeah, it makes sense. And I don't want that to <clears> cause. Problems because sometimes students um, sign up for class A, 
but they actually get put into class B. And then when they get to school, they say, oh, I wanted A, and they go to the counselor and the counselor switches them. Right. Is that going to cause a problem? Right. Okay, so how do we move forward with this? Do we want to be, can we you have guys have asking we, this to be reworked? Can we have Matt check that? Mm -hmm. Oh, it sounds like Matt. I think Matt got it. He's got it. So, so can we, I'm, I'm sorry, don't you know. Can we approve it for first reading and second reading? You come back with the changes. Okay. Okay. Go for it. Any other questions or comments? Then I will entertain a motion. I'd like to make a motion as soon as I get my stuff together. Uh, I'd like to make a motion uh, that the board approves policy 3545 for uh, uh, scholastic academic eligibility for first reading. Second. That's first and a second. Any other questions or comments? Okay, may I call the roll call vote, please. Mr. Galbraith? Yes. Mr. Valentine? Yes. Ms. Thunvik? Yes. Mr. Mabry? Yes. And Mr. Connors? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Scott will continue with policy number 3122, excuse, unexcused absences. Okay, well, the past one was just a three page policy <laughs> right. that we worked through. This is an 11 page yeah, policy, so harder. we'll see if I can't improve my luck with this one. Um, so basically, um, our policy on excused and unexcused absences, policy 312022. Oh, sorry. I guess anybody would bring it up so people can see it. So 3122 needs to be revised based on recent legislation that added general symptoms of mental health wellness um, to as a valid excuse um, for absence. Previous, um, we've had um, inpatient or outpatient care for mental health wellness has been included in the policy. The recent legislation also included um, general symptoms as being um, a valid reason for, for an excused absence. Again, while revisiting and revising the policy, we took opportunity to recommend removal of language that is COVID specific or addresses instructional modes such as remote learning that we do not regularly offer. So we had made those changes in the fall of 2000 or 2020. Um, and so we wanted, we figured as long as we're in here revising, we might as well revise those parts out. Um, so um, again, uh, as we look through the policy, it is a lengthy policy and I'm happy to, at the pleasure of the board, kind of talk about whatever places you'd like to. Um, but on page two specifically is where we made the change in regards to adding in the, the um, symptoms of mental health to be included in excusals, excused absences. Um, and we, there, you'll see throughout most of the rest of the policy, we've removed the additions that we did in 2020 around COVID-19 replacing it on page three with just a general statement that in the event of a natural disaster or an emergency school closure that was due to a natural disaster or communicable disease outbreak and our other events, then there were some rules that, that were developed um, uh, to, to guide absences in those cases. And so we just replaced the COVID specific language with this language that's a bit more general, uh, but it all, it has the same rules around absences and what we can, what absences that are excused and not excused. Um, we also, um, on page six um, and, and in pages beyond that, talked more about our tiered systems of support. Um, Dr. Pierce alluded to that, I think, through the Community Engagement Board. Um, those are just examples of things we do to try to get to the root cause of absence. And so, and then we took out on page seven, the potential loss of credit because we felt that was really more appropriate to be in procedural language um, and it probably didn't and plus there were some things in there that were you know potentially out of date in terms of referring to committees that maybe don't exist and so we wanted to move that into procedure um, and then um, page nine is really more about just differentiated supports that we offer for students and families who are experiencing absences and finally on page 10 we just updated the um, legal references to um, reflect those more accurately. The only question I have is like, um, this is the, like prove is not the right word. 
I understand that. But like, how does like someone, lack of a better word, prove that, that you know, the mental health thing? Do they just, you know, I mean, it's, I mean, if you're sick, you're throwing up, you're throwing, all right, but you say I'm just struggling today mentally and. Yeah, it'd be the same way as with sickness. We don't require a, a doctor's note or a doctor's diagnosis. It's, it's up to the parent. The parent says the student was sick the other yesterday and please excuse the absence and it would be the same way. Okay. Yes, Diane. Matt, on page one, right under definition of absence, so you have the two definitions. On a 1B, not participating, and then um, on two, not participating in any instruction related activity. So if a student is physically present in a class but is not participating or, or refuses to participate, whatever, that student while physically present may be marked absent because that's very different than current practice. No, I think the intent is that they're they're not in class to to receive the instruction. Um, not that they are sitting in class, not participating. It's that they're not physically in class. Because it says under B, not participating in the following activities at an approved location, instruction or instruction related activity. So it, A is not present, B is not participating. But I, I think I, I see where you're going with it. My, my interpretation is you have to you have to a student's absent when A is met. They're not physically present on the ground. So if they're physically present on the ground and not participating, and not participating they're, they're still there because they're present on the ground is the, way, is the way I interpret that. And I would hope it was interpreted that way, but it's a little iffy. Yeah, I, I think as well, and I think what it's trying to say too is if I'm absent from class be, and I'm supposed to be in a field trip or something, but I'm not on that field trip, I'm not I'm not there. <laughs> I mean, that's how I was reading it. If you're if I'm supposed to be somewhere okay. and I'm not there, then I'm absent, whether that's class, my physical classroom where I'm supposed to be or yeah. in so, another activity that you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That or if I'm if I'm physically present in a, but I don't go to fifth period. Instead, I hang out in the bathroom. Correct then I'm considered absent. I am on the physical grounds. I am at school that day, but I'm not in my classroom. I'm not participating in those. It's, it's guiding that. Um, and again, th that part of the language is, I mean, again, not a change from current practice, and I don't think we have any, okay. any lack of clarity on what constitutes that absence, but I understand what okay. you're saying. It's, it can be interpreted it, yeah. differently, but it, I don't believe that it, okay. it has been. Thank you. Uh, just just one comment I think kind of ties into this. Um, we notify parents via phone, via email when students absent. Um, have we, is there any way that we can utilize some sort of platform or maybe this new platform where as a parent you can quickly mark your student absent that would report versus, because I got to be honest with you, I, I just dread calling in in the morning and leaving a voicemail or having to call after hours and leave a voicemail because I forget or whatever. But is there some sort of quick way to do that as a parent, like through PowerSchool or this new platform where if your student's absent, you can just, as the parent, log in, absent, excuse, sick, and, and be done with it? Can you say yes? That would be cool. <laughs> I, I just, I don't know. Why don't I follow up with the team on uh, parent square functionality and that kind of thing and we'll we'll follow up on that just, yeah, yeah, yeah i know you can email i just okay boom, yeah boom, boom, get it is, yeah. that would be know. a cool feature yeah just, uh, awesome thank you we'll find out yeah no i think it's it's always good Whether to try to find more efficient ways to allow families to do what they need to do so yeah, it's a good idea to explore <laughs> I move to approve policy 3122 students excused and unexcused absences for first and second reading. I'll, I'll second. Any other questions or comments? If 
not alcohol, the local vote, please. Mr. Galbraith? Yes. Mr. Valentine? Yes. Ms. Sunbit? Yes. Mr. Mabry? Yes. And Mr. Connor? <coughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, next yeah. on the agenda is policy 2310 instruction section and adoption of instructional materials first reading. Dr. Pierce will be presenting. All right, so one more policy tonight, and I have just a couple of slides to provide a little bit of context and explanation before we get to the actual policy language. So as I mentioned earlier, this year we'll, we will be forming an instructional materials committee. Uh, so I want to just highlight right now what our current policies and processes around adoption of instructional materials, touch on the rationale for the change, and then show you the proposed policy and updated language. So we have two current policies that apply to instructional resources or instructional materials. Uh, those are the things that we adopt, the books and other types of materials to help support teaching of the curriculum. The curriculum is really the scope and sequence, the standards, the program of study that's being taught. So we've got two current policies, 2310 and 2311. And in uh, a nutshell, the processes that are um, specified in those policies are, are what you see on the screen. When it comes to adopting instructional materials, those books and resources and other things that we use to teach the curriculum, there's review and selection by what we call curriculum advisory committees that are made up of staff members. There's a public review period where those uh, instructional resources and materials are available for the public to preview and look at and provide comment on. And then um, they go to the board for approval. And you see those typically they come through consent. When it, and, and that's for uh, major, so think about major textbook adoptions and those, those kinds of things. That's the current process. When it comes to um, supplemental materials, so say in addition to the anthology that I'm using um, as an English teacher, there's uh, novels I want to use. There's policy language about if I'm going to use, you know, it, it, this novel and teach it to my kids and they're going to learn it as a class, then there's policy language that says, so the teacher makes that request, the principal reviews it and um, signs off on it. It then goes to the curriculum advisory committee for review. Then it gets reviewed uh, by assistant superintendents and then it comes to the board for approval. So that's the current process on supplemental materials like novels, things like that. So we want to improve and expand our vetting process for instructional materials. We want to expand the number of people, including parents and staff members and, and um, people <laughs> in our system who are looking at those materials. Uh, we want to ensure that there's a very thorough and formal process for submitting materials to the board. And again, we want to include parents in this process. There's some parent involvement in our, our current processes, but we don't have a formal standing instructional materials committee, and that's pretty common practice for, for many districts. So we are, we're going to form this standing committee that includes staff members, parents, high school students, and community members. And their role will be to review instructional materials, give a final review after it's gone through some preliminary review before they come to the board for approval. So you'll have the recommendation of the instructional materials committee, uh, not just potentially like a recommendation of one of our assistant superintendents or something like that, okay? So uh, IMC membership <coughs> includes uh, will have um, be facilitated by, by the Assistant Superintendent of Teaching and Learning, that's Alyssa St. Hilaire, new to her role this year, so she, she'll be facilitating this process. It's a very formal process and standing committee. They use Robert's Rules of Order. Um, there, it's a big committee. Um, there'll be uh, one uh, district administrator in addition to uh, Alyssa, a building administrator from each level, elementary, middle, and high school, a number of teachers from various levels, elementary, middle, and high school, and various content areas, um, including librarians and other uh, certificated staff, a number of parent slash community members, and high school students, because they give a great perspective uh, at, on uh, materials, elementary, middle, and high school. So the what you're going to see reflected in the policy language is this proposed process. So when it comes to adoption of major materials, 
There'll still be curriculum advisory committees that uh, work to review and select. We had, uh, for example, world language go through that similar process this past year, right? There'll still be a public preview and review period uh, with, the pe with people, anyone able to come in and review the materials and provide feedback. Then those materials and any public comment will go to the instructional materials committee. So that's where the new part of the process comes in. The materials will go through the review of the IMC and then they will come to um, recommendation. If, if the IMC determines they should be recommended for board approval, they'll come to the board. If the IMC doesn't, they won't come to the board. When it comes to the supplemental materials, this just again, teacher request similar about using the novel, sign off by the principal, review by the CAC, the public preview period, then the IMC, then the board. So what this all adds up to when it comes to the actual policies is that we're combining policy 2310, instructional resources, and 2311, selection and adoption of instructional resources, because there was just some redundancy there. And we're adding this language that uh, for the Instructional Materials Committee or the IMC that will make this process happen, which I just described. So the actual policy language, uh, that's not it. There's two policies that we're looking at. First is 2310. <laughs> 2310, we're completely striking through and taking the pertinent language from 2310 and putting it into what is now 2311 and what we're renaming to 2310. Got it. Okay, so that one's all strike through. And now let me bring up the new 2310, which used to be 2311. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, you see the strike through underlined version in front of you. Um, Current language says those district CACs serve as the IMC. That language is coming out because we're formulating the actual IMC, still having the important work of the CACs in place. A uh, couple little language changes. Again, people tend to refer to curriculum and instructional materials it's synonymous, and they're really not. So we're just being clear that this is about instructional materials and resources. Uh, the other substantive change you see here is uh, the new language around the District Instructional Materials Committee, or IMC, a new acronym to learn. <laughs> As Bart said, did you make up a new acronym? <laughs> I can barely remember the other ones. <laughs> and then um, the, it talks about the procedures being established and so forth. And so in the procedure language, it spells out all the membership, uh, of IMC, which I summarized on the slide. Uh, we'll give you updates along the way. Um, once the board approves the policy, we'll start the process of getting the word out for people to apply to be part of the IMC and get the meeting scheduled together and all of that. And we'll keep you updated uh, as we go. But essentially, that's what this policy change and update is all about. questions yeah so my question is how do people get on like parents community members that's always the question right how do they get on it and, yeah. yeah so um, first step is we advertise and, and um, communicate about the the new policy and the resulting new committee that will be formed and there will be uh, application process for um, getting that out and selecting people um, it, it We'll do it similar probably to how we did it with the um, call for people to participate in the comprehensive health process. So there was an application. I know that was a lot of interest in that. Um, this is a standing committee that typically meets monthly. Uh, there's a lot of homework with these types of committees where people are given the books to read and come back and talk about um, with the rest of the committee. So. Um, I'm not sure right now if we're gonna have more people apply to be part of the committee than there are spots, but uh, we would have some kind of fair process if that's the case for determining whether it's drawing straws or whatever, for determining who's gonna be on the committee. We do want diverse representation in terms of, you know, level and um, all kinds of diversity. So we'll take a look at that. Uh, basically, the process though involves inviting people to apply to be part of the committee. 
Thank you for including high school students in this. And how many will be on that committee? Do you have a certain number of slots? We have in mind three. Okay. And is again, it's a big time commitment. It is. <laughs> and it's a standing committee with a, a, a you know work to do. Um, we had a, an IMC in in my former right. district. Uh, we had I think two students on it. Um, it's just tough because they can't always come. Um, we thought by having three, we'd have one more, and at least if one one or two can't come, we'd have one student there. But um, we'll certainly see how it goes. And are there different eligibility criteria for the students than there would be for adults? I don't, I don't believe so. Because I'd like to make sure that we get an excellent cross section of our students, not necessarily just the leadership ASB students. Great. Because Feedback. we often miss many other students that don't fall into that category when we're adopting curriculum. So I'd really yeah. like to make sure that that we get students that give us input into what high interest would be, not just curriculum, but what they might be interested in. Sounds great. Okay. Agree. Uh, just two quick follow ups. So uh, I, I like the committee, so I, I'm, I'm thankful for that. We're putting this together. Um, first question is, they'll still come to the board through the same way they have been, right? So with with the textbooks and those big curriculums, they're presented, we discuss it. Supplementals, will they still come under consent agenda items? Is that correct? So Typically they'll be under the same consent, way? but you'll have what you will receive is more information okay. uh, because they will have gone through the IMC and there's an IMC report that, come, that would come with the materials to sure see what the IMC had to say and will be like some forms or something. So, so the presentation just not being presented in the meeting essentially. Right? Correct. What, Correct. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, and then my, my only other question with just with the curriculum in general, have we thought any more about or is there any way to provide the public review period in a, in a bigger scope for people who may not have time to, to make it to the school or down to the admin building or this, that, and the other. Is there is there some thought of trying to get this to where the community at large can have an easy place to go and review this, or can we do that? I don't even, I don't know. I yeah. just, uh, you know, let me take that back to the team and we'll get, give it some discussion and thought. I know um, with some of the bigger adoptions, there's like there's been school based meetings and opportunities, so parents can go there, and then we also have them here at the district. Um, I, with I, I'm not sure about you know the, like online kinds of things because typically it's like we've got the actual materials if they're not online and people want to look through them but let, mm -hmm. let me just take that comment back to the team and see what we can maybe brainstorm are you asking like alternate days or times um what well, yeah almost like I mean if we're gonna be open let's be honest like we did the levy presentations and we had four people show up but if we if we're able to, in a similar vein and i know we broadcast those but if we can have some sort of way where they can watch the the committee or the instruction material or it's presented where they can do it while they're you know sitting at their kids practice waiting to pick them up or just something to supply feedback that's going to maybe garner a larger response because we know probably most of the materials don't have a ton of response and we probably don't get a lot of people showing up to review them per se, but just just trying to collect yeah. a, a large or portion of feedback is all. If we can do it, great. If we can't, it, it is where we're doing it. So I'd like to ask about an alternate time because 830 to 4 is not necessarily a convenient time for when most people work. And we're open here till 5 maybe, but still, if you're working eight, 10 hour shifts and you're having to go back and forth, you're not going to be able to make it. So an evening shift or, you know, just one time at least when that would be available to people who can't make it during those bankers hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's good. Let's let me let me take that back too. <laughs> and then do we have interpreters during those times when those are available? Because not everything is in and are you, are you talking about the preview times, like when Correct. people can come in and get the materials and because look at them? Because if I come in to look at an English curriculum, for example, or a, a book, um, if I don't speak English, 
I can look through the book, but I may not be very mm -hmm. able to figure out what the book is about. And if we're talking about getting more diverse people to be on our committees, I'd like them to be able to know, you know, what that book their child will be looking at so mm -hmm. yeah let me give that one some thought too all good good feedback and it all it, uh just need some time to kind of think through and figure out what's what's possible excuse my only question is how many people are in total are you thinking will be on this off the top of my head it was like 14 it's it's like upwards of 29 yeah that's it's a big committee big group that's a lot of. Yeah. It's a yeah. great group. <clears throat> well, it's well, it's going to be. You've got your work cut out for you. You're going to be hurting a lot of. Oh, well, she's really smart. No, she's right. Right. Great. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, any other comments or questions? If not, I will entertain a motion. I move that the board approve policy 2310, mm -hmm. uh, instruction selection and adoption of instructional materials for first and second reading. Second. Any other questions or comments? If not, I'll call for the roll call vote, please. Mr. Galbraith? Yes. Mr. Valentine? Yes. Ms. Thunvik? Yes. Mr. Mabry? Yes. And Mr. Connors? Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, next is our talking about our next meeting agenda. Currently, we have the strategic goals report. Strategic Oh, so we, sorry, let me read this again. The strategic goals report. All students are engaged learners. Uh, strategic goal report that all families are key partners in the annual update on the technology operations. Anything else you guys would like to add or questions to go to the next agenda? Sorry, guys, I got a lot of disturbance today. Um, is we could can we clarify our policy on having arms or weapons at school board meetings? Yeah, that's a good one, uh, Ron, because there's a whole host of new laws that were passed in the last legislative mm -hmm. session that are requiring us to go make sure that our policy is in line with that because and that's one of them okay. that um, I know we do have the sign out front that says you can have a firearm on on um, in here, like this is just like school premises. Mm -hmm. And um, so we'll just make sure that's a good one to loop back on. We've got it on, in our queue. And, and there's some tricky, tricky phrases. And because if you lease a room, let's say at the, at the, uh, at the, at some wedding venue, mm -hmm. but you're performing school business, then it applies, right? right? So I just think we need to make sure we all know and are on the same page about where we can and can't have weapons. Yep. How much of that is the state law versus our, you know? <clears throat> yeah, and we can clarify on yeah. that. I mean, there there's some new law and we'll get right, real specific into what the law language says. Every year, um, we get a, a big report um, from with help from WASA and WASDA and all those people that say these are all the bills that passed right. into law in the last legislative session. And so <coughs> make sure you're updating your policies and everything to align with the new law. And so that's one of a, of a number of them. So thanks, Ron. Um, I know we're moving in into something different with the, the General Assembly stuff, but I don't know if we need to clarify now we might need to put that back on the agenda for next month for follow-up so i'm just trying to i guess do it more in order maybe we don't have to after a conversation i just okay what's well, why don't we just why don't we have a conversation in. see where we fall and then if Perfect. we need data back we'll we'll add it back well it, you could just put conversation about general assembly and it could be anything it could be the dates it could be the places whatever okay. if you need to do that okay we'll add that Okay, anything else? Okay, if not, we will go on to other business. Uh,
the board in preparation for the WASDA General Assembly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, uh, I shared some information with the board about this topic. And uh, so this is really a time for the board to have a discussion about how you want to approach that. As a quick reminder, uh, the board wants to talk about a process for prioritizing legislative positions and determining who's going to be the board member appointed to cast the vote on behalf of the board during General Assembly. Uh, it's scheduled virtually for September 30th and October 1st. All the information is on the WASDA website. Uh, and everybody can participate, but only one person can have the vote, but the vote can be moved between members at the time. So you all are probably more uh, knowledgeable about this topic than I am, but I just wanted to make sure you had the opportunity to talk about what process that you want to um, use. And you know if there's anything that you need from staff or me to help, to help with the process. So in the past, how have we handled, or how has the board handled the voting? Send a legislative rep, has been the voter, and then trade it off to, like when you're, when Ron was ledge rep, he couldn't, and I did it for the period of time that he was in another meeting. So it could be given to any other. Gotcha. So it was all right. So, but so the ledge rep, that has been the, the historical process. Okay. Depending on who else is there. I mean, not everybody may be there at all times. So that would, would be the thing you need to know who's going to be there at all times because sometimes you, you may be working at your other job and you say I'll come in at four or whatever so we would need to know who's there at what time in case whoever gets the vote is not able to be there are there yeah. several several votes during the time there I, many, I have not attended, it's so. only that pretty much just vote after vote after vote it's, yeah there's is, there, is there any comment like comment and debate there's and, stuff. There's, and there's, anybody yeah. any board member can comment and stuff. yes absolutely and that's okay. that's what it's all about yes yeah, so they're setting up for the November issue yeah so there's so like they, they debate a topic then the vote and then just the, just the legislative rep or whoever the appointed Correct. person is that, and, these are, and then they yeah. debate and then okay and, and, and the person who would vote would <clears throat> would vote based on what the our board I would hope so. Yeah, had yeah. a consensus. On. Yeah, and that's my question: is how do we know what our board has a consensus on? We should meet before. Well, yes, that's because hopefully you we will meet before we should, and we should be talking about it because we have that list of of things you know, that will be coming. So we should put that on the docket at some point. Mm -hmm. so, so is this something for those of you who have attended? You kind of show up, and they just go through legislative priorities and position priorities and then everyone is just it's just kind of a all-day vote you based on so how your boards i mean that's the gist of it it's so it's all of the i mean because it's like a 190 page handout so yes. okay and it will be in section so each specific section as will be okay um and then they save some for later if they're going to have more but generally you go chronologically I guess okay. we can talk about it when we get to talk about our positions because it is a process and there's strategy. Yeah. And one thing you you want to take care of your bathroom visits because if you're not there, they give you yeah. bathroom visits. Do you have I I shredded my old one. Do you have one of your old copies from that? I don't know. I probably do. Uh, because we can show you how quickly it moves and what's yeah. in it. I don't. I know I don't have mine because I shredded it. But, yeah. but it's very organized. Yes. Ro Rogers rules. Roberts rules of order and you get to debate and you do you get a car you get to stand up and everyone in the room can walk up to the Except microphone we'll here. and they will and they everyone will comment and we can talk about it later but we have to be sure on our stances because it may be different than three schools on the west side that has a huge voting capability and they're joined together There's some weightedness they're joined together and outvote you. So yeah. our strategy has to be sound. And there also has to be some uh, communication uh, by SL because if somebody changes something, oh, we may not approve yeah, or disapprove sure. that. We may need to discuss that very quickly. Mm -hmm. so, or, or trust, or ledger. Or, or, yeah, or say what if it changes. Yeah. OK. Yeah, I, I just wanted to know how we kick this off and how we do it. So it I'm happy to. Very quickly, and in fact, last year we were done early on both <laughs> both days. I, I would tell you, I would not be there. 
it's almost all day. It depends. It's it could be all, day. All, all day. It yeah. could be only part of all day. Yeah. Long, it could go till eight or nine o'clock at night. It generally. I won't you know. be here. I won't, I won't be. Okay. Here. No. So uh, on the on the WASDA site, they suggest that you determine that the board determine the board's top 20 positions. And so with that process, they said you want to discuss the legislative positions up for a vote, review the standing ledge positions. There's links to all of this. Look at last year's legislative priorities and then survey fellow members and combine results. So I'm not sure how you want that process to happen um, at this. There's, you know, a September 14th board meeting with business items that are here on the agenda. Then the, the next board meeting remembers a study session focused on levy. So there's one board meeting between now and September 30th, but it sounds like there might be able to be some things that individual board members do that then may, may combine us, or mm -hmm. may I make a suggestion? And it, it's pretty much that I suggest look over these in the luxury of your living room okay. or your favorite chair or whatever. And then the ones that you feel really strong about, maybe we send out an email. Say, hey, you know, we say, hey, I do not do an email, yeah. I don't think. I wonder if what we could do, so you. No, not as a vote. I'm sorry, go on. Go on. Um, kind of along the same lines, though, of what you're saying. I wonder if each board member individually identified your priorities mm -hmm. and then you sent those to to Mike and to me. OK. Then I could try to compile that somehow right. to say and then send it back out so there's That's some of that pre-work it but it avoiding the board having any yeah. sort of dialogue over something like that uh, and yeah. you can take those 20 priorities and list them one through 20. Mm. Uh, you like which one's your higher priority yes. for you yeah. or something and so, if yeah, you don't would, care about one you can just say don't care yeah. you know, and i would i'd like to do that a lot better than the way we did last year when we were just had to rank two pages of stuff. I Last thought that year made my head was explode. Was something new that Waza was trying. They supposedly have something this year, but I have not seen it yet. That is, we would send them the information and it would all be compiled cool. there. That has not come out yet, but I'm hoping to hear next week. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Well, we'll to be to be continued, obviously. So you need to decide who's going to do your. Well, I mean, if the, if the lead rep is, if that's what we've been been doing historically, I don't, I don't see yeah. a reason to change. I, I don't have an issue. I mean, I'm happy to help if you have happy, something that you I'm need to do. To, I, I'm happy to do it. No, and okay. I'll be there. What I really need to know is who will be there at what time in case something happens, then I can't. And yeah. and then there's a process that we I just would send them a message and say Dave has it, Micah has yeah. it, Mike has it, and okay. then you get to vote. So it's very easy, it's done very simply. But I just would need to know. And like if you say I'm going to be there at a certain time, and then something happens, that they whoops, sorry, can't be there. Yeah. So that's that's very easily done under the system. So we're okay. happy to do it. Sounds great. Any other thoughts or comments? All right. Okay, so I'll follow up again with the with the information and the links and some maybe time frames of when to send the information so we have enough time to compile it prior to September 14th. And everybody can just go on the Lawista website and read those. If you there's links to links to links to tell mm -hmm. you more about things if you have questions about them. Yeah. And if you have more questions, uh, connect with one of Lawista people and they will give you an hour of their time. That's okay. what they're there for. They're happy to do that. Perfect. Cool. Anything else? Well, if nothing else, we're going to adjourn the meeting. I love it. Look Yay. at this. Seven. Seventeen. That's right. We're so efficient. Yay. Beautiful. Done. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. I don't know what to do with myself. <laughs> I was going to say. Take your wife out for a walk. Mm -hmm. Yeah.